Welcome to the ODPP Cafe. We are live on Facebook. This is the only show that aims to discuss the criminal justice system and other conversations in law. We welcome you to join the conversation. My name is Anita. I'll be your host for today. We are live on Facebook, like I mentioned earlier. We are also on Twitter at ODPP uh, underscore KE. And we are also on uh, YouTube uh, live, uh, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. We welcome you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We welcome you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, uh, tell a friend, call a friend. Let's, know, let's, let's learn the law together. We shall definitely look at your comments and questions on, uh, on social media at the, end, at the tail end of this uh, broadcast. Broadcast, yes. And of course, uh, as you get to the discussion, we invite you to just engage with us uh, live. So as always, we start with the courts and look into what has been happening in the courts this week. I always say a disclaimer that it's not exhaustive. It is just a bit of what has been going on in the courts. Of course, a lot has been happening, but this is just a little a sneak peek into what has been in the courts today. So I start with a very controversial and very sad story about the Kianjo Koma brothers, the murder trial. The six police officers who are suspected of murdering two Embu brothers filed an application at the Milimani Law Court on Thursday seeking suspension of the prosecution to allow for fresh investigations. The six want their siblings remains exhumed and a fresh post-mortem conducted. So every time we talk about uh, delays or delay of cases and, and why some things take too long, this is one of the reasons. These people still have a, have a reason to ask the court for delays, they have the defense counsel also plays its role, and this is one of those things they do. They ask for either an extension or they ask for the court to do something about it. So for this reason, you will see the case dragging a bit. So the six officers accused of involved of the of the murder of the siblings are Benson Budia, Consolata Karioki, Martin Wanyama, Lilian Cherono, Nicholas Sang, and James Mwaniki. So the prosecution led by uh, Jacinta Nyamosi made the application to remand the officers for 14 days to ensure that investigations are not compromised. The suspects will be arraigned in court for plea taking on 31st August 2021. Remember again when we discussed about bail and bonds, this also came up that in as much as everybody has a right to, uh, to, to get bail and bond, the prosecution can ask for, for, for them to be remanded for so that they don't compromise the investigations. So that case is ongoing. Let's see what happens on 31st of August 2021 when they are going to take their plea. The next case is about a Nairobi MCA who was found guilty of corruption. The court convicted and sentenced a former Maringo Hamza Ward MCA, Njogona Mwangi. He was asked to pay 300k in default or serve one year in prison for soliciting for a bribe of 280k. So the other case against him was that uh, he had... Uh, he is to serve one year in jail or pay 200K for receiving 140K to stop demolitions at Saika Market. So this was an MCA who was found guilty of corruption and he has two cases against him. And we'll discuss a little bit about these prison sentences because I also don't get it half the time when they say the, the, the what is it called? It will run concurrently. So we'll have uh, our experts here talk to us about this. So the prosecution team here led by Helen Mutella, Terry Kahoro, you've met Terry here. And Uni Solo convinced the court that Mr. Mwangi committed the offense. They presented nine witnesses, and uh, Chief Magistrate uh, Honorable Tinzioki said the sentences will run concurrently, and that is what I mean. We need to understand this concurrently, what it means. Dioki Patikano, and we're concurrently with Joanie Nini Utasema. So uh, another uh, case is about a murder suspect uh, seeking plea again, a suspect in the murder of Dutchman, Herman Rovenhorst, I hope I pronounced it right, and his guard sought a plea again in the prosecution, prosecution. We have discussed plea again, and we can discuss it again should you want us to repeat the, the, the whole session. Then you understand what this means. Prosecution counsel Valerie Ongeti informed the High Court of the intention to turn Mary Nekesa into a prosecution witness. Uh, Nekesa is the girlfriend of Timothy Omondi, a prime suspect in the murder, agreed to cooperate with the, co with the prosecution to solve the murder mystery in return for a reduced sentence. So you see, for plea bargain, like we said earlier, it's not a free pass, it's not a through pass. You'll have to still go through the, the justice system uh, to some extent. So the court is definitely going to make a ruling on this. Nekesa and Omondi are alleged to have murdered Robin Horst and God and God Evans Bokoro at his Roko apartment in Shanzu area, Mombasa County. The court directed Nekesa to be remanded in Malindi uh, while Omondi at Shimolatewa prison. 
The court also directed the suspect to be taken to Coast General Hospital, where they will undergo a mental assessment. The case to resume is to resume on September 16th, where the two will take a plea on the matter. Again, a mental assessment, we discussed it here again. You see the show is about educating you, and I'm learning as well. So the mental assessment is something they have to go through before the case begins for the court to just assess that they're in their right mind to understand what's going on during the trial. I believe so. Uh, let me see. The next case is a man charged with multiple murder, a suspected serial killer. Evans Wanjala was charged with murder of three girls in Moise Bridge, was in Gishu County. The prosecution submitted that Wanjala killed State Yaching in Soy on diverse dates between 31st 2017 and January 2020. He was also accused of killing Linda Cherono in Moise Bridge between June 11th and 15th this year, and Mary Eruza at Tria Bay in Soy between 15th and 16th of 20. A case of a serial killer in Kenya. So this is ongoing. He's been charged with a multiple murder. Uh, so Anjala denied the charges and through his lawyer, Michael Masinde, asked the court to release him on bond. The prosecution through Jarlson Macquarie opposed his application, citing the possibility of witness interference. He'll be remanded at Eldoret uh, Prison. The case will be mentioned again on September 8th before the High Court in Eldoret. Again, bail and bond uh, shows up in this case again. A 37-year-old man in Juja was accused of killing his estranged wife by stabbing her 17 times. He pleaded not guilty to the murder. The prosecution submitted that one Evans Kamau broke into Esther Nyanga's home in Elmark Estate, Juja, and disconnected the power supply before stabbing her 17 times on 8th of August. Oh my, this is quite serious. So this case is of this guy who committed some serious violence on his, on his wife. Mr. Kamau will be remanded at the Juja police station as he awaits hearing of his bail application, which is slated for September 8th. I think that is as much as we had from the courts. Again, my disclaimer, my usual disclaimer, is that this is not conclusive. This is not conclusive. It's not exhaustive. A lot has happened. And I know you've been following either on traditional media or social media. The goodness that we keep getting updated as, as time goes by. So today our discussion will be on transnational and organized crime. I know we had had this discussion before, I think, two sessions back. But today we are looking at it from a different perspective from a regional perspective. Transnational and organized crime was discussed here extensively, but today we want to just repeat this, this, uh, this topic with another dimension. So I will bring you to a story that happened in 2010 about the Kampala bomb attacks. This is one of the cases that showcased how transnational crime occurs. But then today in the show, we have two experts, one from the OTPP and one from ESTC, so that we link this whole transnational and organized crime to, to see how corruption plays in this space of transnational and organized crime. So Kenya is very strategically situated. We are an economic and a tourist hub. That means all manner of things and, and good things and bad things happen. So you want to see because we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of as, as it presents itself. So allow me to introduce my guests. We have a lady in the show, and of course, uh, ODPP. I want to start with the lady, because ladies first, Karibu Sana. Thank you, Sana. Please introduce yourself to the guest and tell us uh, what you do and where you do it. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Patricia Chebet Kinoti, and I serve uh, the EACC in the Investigation Directorate. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a trained investigator. I also serve the commission in the Mutual Legal Assistance Unit, which means uh, we make requests and receive requests from other jurisdictions to assist in criminal investigation. So that is what I do, and that is where I do it. <laughs> Karibu sana to the show. Thank you for coming. Okay. Bitonga, Thank Karibu you. sana. Please introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Why you do it. Thank you for having me, yes. uh, Anita. Mm -hmm. My name is Gitonga Muranga. Mm -hmm. I currently work at the executive office of the DPP. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what we call the secretariat unit. Uh, but I also head a, a unit called the Proceeds of Crime Unit. And I'm also the focal point of the, the Eastern and Southern African Anti-Money Laundering Group. Oh. And also the coordinator of the um, 
East African Association of Prosecutors. Wow. So I coordinate the secretary's activities on under EAP. 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 I keep yes. saying EAPP for some reason I confuse it. But I, I believe uh, today's show also has some, uh, we are also looking at what's going to be happening at the EAPP next week. Yes. Yes. Now, I want to start the show again with just a definition. I know you've defined transnational and organized crime before, but I know somebody has joined the show for the first time. So for the sake of that person and myself again, just to learn again, what is transnational and organized crime in, in just a definition, Gito? I would, I would term transnational crime as a crime that is transboundary in nature, crime that can go, that happens in multiple jurisdiction or in more than one jurisdiction mm -hmm. but there's the distinction between trans when you say transnational crime and transnational organized crime oh, yes. transnational organized crime is when you have um, a, a group of maybe two or three who have organized themselves primarily to undertake crime for profit mm -hmm. they make money yes. it's a business enterprise so that's perhaps uh, the simplest distinction it's I can distinction. I can give. So yeah. it's about profit making. They make profit, but through crime, mm -hmm. and they are organized. You know, like the way you can have an army mm -hmm. having a commander, mm -hmm. and then you have different ranks. So in this case, you'll find there's a CEO, and there are various other players that make it organized. So that's how organized will will entail. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm wondering, is it? Is this about the number of people that involved or the location in which the family just be and then you reduce something, you organize for a client, and that is that a transnational and organized crime? Yeah, um, yes, we don't have to be passing through a foreign national ideology. I mean, it is a partnership or someone who can coordinate or assist you in a foreign jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. transnational and organized crimes does it mean that you're of different nationalities or could it be that you're just from one country but uh, organizing crime in another i mean how does that work okay so i mean an ideal situation for an organized unit would be to have someone from a different country to represent you and your interests in that country but it's not it's not necessarily that way you could all be kenyan mm -hmm. you could be kenyans with dual citizenship or you could be kenyans too with access to facilities in a foreign jurisdiction that means that you're allowed to open a bank account or you can trade in a foreign country or you can uh, send your money to this other jurisdiction so in that sense you could all be kenyan mm -hmm. but still uh, committing even offenses across other jurisdictions mm -hmm. like I, I think a good example is cyber crime yes because you could be here remotely uh, located in nairobi in kawangware but the crimes you're perpetrating are in new york or somewhere yeah. else yeah. so that would be a good example you don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to be from uh, you have to be multinational in your organization. I'll give you an example, Anita. There was a case in which we actually assisted the United States to extradite a Kenyan who was um, just undertaking wire, wire fraud from Kenya, uh, defrauding universities in the United States. And a Kenyan? A Kenyan, just seated in his house somewhere or so, seated somewhere and he was defrauding universities uh, in, in, in America. Yeah. That's that's what globalization and uh, advancement of technology has done. You yeah. could be in the comfort of your home, but the effects of your crimes are being felt uh, yeah. miles, miles away. Miles away. Yeah. So you've mentioned fraud, but how else does transnational and organized crime manifest? Because we are saying now that uh, it differs from other crimes because it is cross-border. But then, then how, what are those, like uh, an example, examples of crimes that come under transnational and organized crime? 
mostly you find uh, maybe uh, the, the op often the crimes that you'll find happening cross border or having a transnational element will be things like corruption. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, that's why my sister here will be able to yeah. have a lot of experience in that. Terrorism, mm -hmm. like you find, uh, like what happened with the Dusit, um, uh, Garissa attack, uh, that's something that happens. Then money laundering, when you're money laundering, remember the, 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 the whole purpose of money laundering is moving money and disguising it uh, from the sources. Money laundering, no issue. Wash, wash, yes. Uh, basically, just trying to clean up the money. But remember, that money comes from somewhere. Um, it could be just normal theft, but uh, it, wildlife crime. Uh, like um, nowadays, you find a lot of these crimes are no longer happening in isolation. So you could find like somebody is poaching, then those uh, wildlife trophies are sold. Mm -hmm. That money is used to buy drugs. Then it comes back. It pays for. Uh, find, uh, uh, campaigns uh, for somebody to yes. to be to be voted an MP. Yeah. That uh, MP gets power. Yeah. He comes up with another enterprise so of a, a drug syndicate. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a brother and sister affair of a uh, 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 most toxic uh, kind of uh, combination you can ever get yeah. nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. I, I failed to ask you. Do you guys watch this series on Netflix about transnational crime? And if you do, John is your favorite. Actually, for me, the best way I can I can I can uh, explain transnational crimes in terms of a series yes. would be Narcos, uh -huh. the story of uh, Esco, uh, Pablo, Pablo Escobar. Yes, yes. If you watch Narcos, you will get the whole concept. Yes. And also, I think there is a series called Ozark. Yes, Ozark. Ozark you, if you watch Ozark, you will get uh, a sense of. What, what malinandering really entails. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you watch Amy? Do you have a favorite? I, I think for me, I wouldn't call it a favorite because mm. it was very sad, but it would be the, the documentary on uh, Epstein, Filthy mm. Rich, mm -hmm. uh, because that is, it showcases human trafficking, which is one oh, yes. of the major yeah. transnational crimes mm -hmm. that happen, and, and corruption as well, yeah. because with it goes a lot of money, a lot of powerful mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. and how they then just bend and mm. they breach the laws across different jurisdictions yeah, yeah. because they can get away with it. Yeah. So that, that would be my that, that, that was quite sad by the way. Yeah. So we've talked about corruption and even when I said at the show we say that it all boils down to corruption. Corruption is like the curse of our generation. So how how does it play out in transnational organized crime? We're used to seeing corruption in traffic, government offices, but then how does it how do you put it in the context of transnational organized crime? No, in the context of corruption, mm. um, I think corruption is a big deal because sometimes it ends up being um, beneficial to the perpetrators. Like what uh, uh, Gitonga just said is that it's lucrative, it's profit making, it's about the money. So when it comes to corruption, the first thing that comes to your mind is how do you secure the money? And sometimes there are other elements that you consider about how to secure your money when, when you're in an organized unit that's committing crime. So you are trying to make it as difficult as possible for a law enforcement agency to access your money or to track your money. And you're also trying to make a profit. So the things that come into consideration would be which country is a good tax haven. Mm -hmm. So that means that I can get my money there with least tax deductions. Mm -hmm. And uh, which country can I register my company and they don't necessarily have laws that would easily divulge ownership details of this company. So you go register in the Cayman Islands or the BVI. So in, from a corruption angle, it's mostly concealment. So the, the target of the person who is perpetrating these crimes is to conceal their mm -hmm. activities yeah. and to make it difficult for law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. to keep track. Yeah. Yeah. Why is Kenya such a, a, what is a wet zone for corruption? I mean, we almost go quite low when it comes to corruption. Why are we so vulnerable to this? I think Kenya has... Um, we have an open market, which is a good thing in the sense that uh, many people have access to government money. In fact, with the, with the advent of devolution, yes. you have a lot of budgetary allocation that is going down mm -hmm. to the respective counties mm -hmm. and they have charge of those funds mm -hmm. and how to manage them. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a good thing in that sense that um, there are many actors who have been allowed to, to deal with government resources and with other personal resources. Yeah. So with that comes access. I would call it an, an ease of access to this kind of money. Mm -hmm. So that's how we, I would say we Kenya are is a, quite Yes, we are, we are also we are a wealthy country. We are as compared to most. Yes, we are. 
Yeah. Like little mess not just <laughs> but we have a lot of resources. Yeah. We have uh, quite a lot of resources at our disposal. Yeah. And even um our our budget is, is huge. It is yes, yeah. as compared to yeah. most countries. Yeah. So Bitonga, transnational and organized crime is quite a beneficiary of globalization and and internet, you know, like just some background on that. Do you almost feel like we should we should this globalization thing should just be put to a stop or because it's one of the negatives of globalization? I, I I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing that we are globalized. It's a good thing we are advancing technology. Right. We only need to keep up. Yes. To keep up with the pace. Yeah. So you find that um, maybe the developed countries are keeping up with their systems, but we are lagging behind. Mm -hmm. So ours is just to keep up with the pace mm -hmm. and uh, develop systems mm -hmm. that will be able to allow us to to be ahead of the criminals because even uh, criminals walali. Mm. They are not sleepy. Mm. They are scheming they are every day, <laughs> just like the enemy. Yeah. You know, so they are scheming every day. So if they are scheming every day and working on how to commit crime, we should also be scheming every day. But if we, uh, in quote scheming, you know, finding out how to 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 get them, yeah. so that we are always ahead of the game. Yeah. So the idea is that since government has been entrusted by its citizens to protect them against harm, yes. we should be able to use taxpayers' money to be able to get state-of-the-art yeah. uh, facilities, pay the best uh, prosecutors like yeah. we is happening yeah. now, yeah. have the best on board, have yeah. people like ESCC who are well-equipped and well-trained to be able to keep up. Mm -hmm. If we are not trained consistently to keep up with the changing trends, then it will mean that we are always going to be playing catch-up. Catch up. Yeah, yes. that's quite unfortunate. Yes. So again, we saw that uh, TOC has an impact on development of a country. Yes. And of course, uh, economic and people suffer through it. But then I would want us to give it a human look. How, how does TOC uh, impede national development? I mean, if you have to explain to me, so that Anita or the person who's watching right now, a common person, gets to get, the, what is it called, empowered by this knowledge. Why should I care about this whole transnational and organized crime as a citizen? Okay, uh, a, a simple way of, of looking at it is uh, look at the people who do contraband, like uh, uh, bringing uh, things from other countries without paying tax or, yeah. or, or, or things that are not good quality. That means if you take something that is not good quality, you get bad health, you yes. get, you'll get sick or whatever. If you get uh, bad quality, again, it means you're not getting value for money. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you're getting low value goods, it means uh, that you're unable to perform the functions that you should be doing with those goods that you're buying. But most importantly, the country loses that revenue that, it's get, that it will have got maybe from, from the border because these goods are maybe smuggled or uh, got in through some other means. Mm -hmm. This is now a simple way of, of looking at how uh, transnational crime, this is now trafficking in goods. Yes. It's the same thing with trafficking in persons. Uh, it's the same thing with... What is that human trafficking in, in, in East Africa, for example? Uh, yeah? I, I, I think it, it's common, um, it, especially if you look at the trafficking routes. Uh, yeah. Because of our porous borders, you find they, they look for all loopholes to be able to move people across even up to the whole way up to South Africa yeah. going uh, taking advantage but some of them are trafficked for for labor mm -hmm. uh, sex uh, among other um, issues but the whole idea remember there's someone making money there's someone making money to move those goods from point or people from point A to point B uh, there's some there's a network that is benefiting from that criminal activity mm -hmm. uh, the, so how does the society suffer yeah. this this, uh, as I said, the other than the goods, other than the loss of revenue, these are other people who are affected, human beings that are part of our society. Mm -hmm. um, loss of revenue, mm -hmm. it, 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 funds, it funds a system, a system of a criminal network that either will be the ones who uh, support or, or campaign for your next MP. Mm -hmm. That MP will make sure that the laws that pass in parliament are not good enough to fight crime, mm -hmm. uh, that MP will make sure that, or that lawmaker, or that politician, or that uh, person will make sure that they use their money as much as possible to ensure that they evade justice mm -hmm. and they are always ahead of 
uh, of law enforcement. Mm. That's how it affects society. Mm. Okay. Yes. So let me ask corruption again. Uh, how do you rank in East Africa? Where do we rank? Are we the worst? <laughs> Are we the ones doing the best in combating it? But more so, how do you investigate corruptions across borders? Do you do you have to what partner with other countries? Is it working? I think um, how we rank as a country, we have made strides um, as Kenya in terms of avenues for combating corruption. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that uh, we have ratified treaties that mm -hmm. allow us to request for mutual legal assistance from foreign Yes, so ratified. <laughs> what does ratified mean? It means that Kenya has uh, signed a treaty which says that... An uh, agreement. An agreement. Yeah, an yeah, agreement yeah. Is, is a better way. Yeah. So, um, which allows us to request for information or evidence from foreign jurisdiction uh, to our to ours. An example is the uh, UNCAC, that's the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. And then um, Kenya has also has that's an international one. So, as a region, we have entered into agreements within our region. And an example is the East African uh, Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities. Oh, there's also one like that? Yes, we okay. have one. And they entered into, they, they call it the Kampala Agreement mm -hmm. in 2007, which uh, has um, Uganda, it has Kenya, it has Tanzania. And then in East Africa, we also have um, what is called the Arin Network. That is... Um, Asset Recovery Agency. So we have ARINEA, which is ARINEA, that's East Africa, mm -hmm. which brings together about eight East African countries fighting corruption and giving each other support in terms of information and uh, gathering intelligence across the agencies. This would have uh, Rwanda, it has Burundi, it has um, Tanzania, it has South and Sudan, and um, Uganda and Tanzania, yes. Mm -hmm. So we have made strides in terms of being aware that corruption is an issue in East Africa and how can we tackle it. I think those are some of the efforts that mm. the Commission as well as the country has made. Mm. Have you had any success stories? Yes, uh, we have success stories in terms of information sharing that we've been able to share. Um, the networks that I've mentioned are for intelligence gathering. So some of the success stories are not necessarily even mentioned by name because some are active cases before court in these jurisdictions that I have mentioned, and some are the intelligence stage, which means that we have gathered that the information they require for evidence and sent it back to these jurisdictions. So yes, there are several instances of cooperation between us and East African countries, as well as other international countries across mm. the borders. Okay. Yes. So the law is clear, the institutions. Yes, there are the institutions, there is the law, we are actually. You want to do? We are actually yes. <laughs> you remember the cold case? Yes. The cold case was one of the the ones with Tanzania where we managed to cooperate and exchange some. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. That, For the benefit of whoever is watching, what was Yeah, that? so at least we were able to work with the Tanzanians and um, surrender some of the items that we had co uh, we had we had seized mm -hmm. um, that were of a, of a person that had been arrested in Kenya. Uh, was, which entailed some foreign currency and some 35 kgs of gold. Okay. We were able to take it back. Uh, we have various other examples of where we've been able to cooperate even within the region, mm -hmm. as, especially within the Eastern African aspect, uh, mm -hmm. that we continue to cooperate either formally or informally. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can allow me, Anita, to say one of the importance of uh, some of these networks that uh, my colleague has touched on. Yeah. So you find like uh, the like some of the agencies like uh, the uh, asset recovery um, uh, network, asset recovery international uh, uh, agency network, the the agency that now we work on asset recovery issues. We have the East Africa Association of Prosecutors. These networks that we have across uh, the region are supposed to help us to be able to touch base. Yeah. Also break barriers. You know, like. Like the way we are talking now, uh, you can imagine if you know your counterpart from Tanzania, uh, your counterpart from Rwanda, and you know them by name, and you you you, you even know how they, they they are as a person. So when you have an issue in Kenya, and there is an active case you're actually investigating, and you need some assistance, you just take the phone call mm -hmm. and you call a person you actually know. You say, "Sasa, Sema, I, uh, I have this case, active case." It's happening like this. Can you assist me? I'm a Natuma 
uh, document ebu angalia please expedite it, it works like that yes yeah. that's the whole essence of the network mm. so when we meet like the way uh, we are going to uh, i'll tell you about it later yeah. how we are going to arusha to meet at the east african association of prosecutors you get to know one another break barriers mm -hmm. um get to know how we all relate how also learn about each other's legal systems yeah. the challenges that uh, we go through and then come up with a, a common way to tackle our common challenges because you remember if we share borders uh it's more likely the crimes will are the will are the same yeah. and the challenges will be the same mm -hmm. the the networks the criminal networks will be the same mm -hmm. so you can imagine if i'm able to say we're having this active case in which somebody is we think is sending money to your country can you look into it mm -hmm. then instead of me traveling they can start on it from the other side yeah. and it's someone i can talk to informally no, even before documents <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because Im imagine if we were just to use paperwork. When you send a request or you send information, you want this or that to another country, they just see paper. Uh, the facts are there, the what, there is no uh, connection with yeah. that document. It's just facts. Yeah. It's just paper. Yeah. But imagine, you know, on the other line, it's Gitonga, your friend that you met at this network. Yeah, yeah. Makes it, it, it makes, makes it easy. You're very, able to connect with the with with the, with the it's case. It's easy, by the way. Yeah, I think it, to, to add on to what you say, yeah. I think when when we form the network, since there's an organized unit that is committing crime, our response also needs to be organized. organized yes. Which essentially why regional cooperation and international cooperation becomes important. Yes. Because it means that you have somebody on the other end who is also helping you fight the graft that the is going thing, on. Yes. Yeah. So that when I'm making a request, I would want to know in Uganda if I want my request to be to be to be expedited, yeah. what do I need to do? What uh, who do I need to get in touch with? How do I need to frame my request mm -hmm. for assistance? Mm -hmm. So when we have this network, you have people who are on call to assist. Mm -hmm. So you create a, a pool of advisors and uh, people who can help you see what are the legal challenges and how can we circumvent them to ensure yeah. that we beat we beat this crime yeah. or that we can ensure that I have spotted your assets. We are currently constructing a huge hotel in yes. our yeah. in our CBD, yeah. and uh, <laughs> we are seeing it growing. Uh, we are aware that the funds are from the country. Mm -hmm. um, how when do we help you get this back? What happens when that uh, that uh, what is it called that uh, investment? Is benefiting country B, in as much as it was a crime that was what that was done country A. Yeah. Will they still come out and tell you to mo nakale kauteli like ni bine na kusaidi watu akwe chuta pati watu job? Do you ever do you ever come to those discussions? Do the discussions do. ever get to that point? We do. Yeah. But when it comes to international crime, there's a there's, there's a principle called reciprocity which means I would want you to do for me as I am doing yes, for you. Yes. So if you were to put yourself in country B's shoes, regardless of how beautiful the investment is, it is money that is chipping away at another economy. Yeah. So no country wants to be associated with growth that is has its foundation on crime mm -hmm. because it's not internationally accepted, it's not good for business. Mm -hmm. So as much as those uh, the wonderful things that would come, like maybe there'd be many people employed or the yeah. hotel would be tax, uh, tax yeah. and revenue, yeah. the the crime the crime itself becomes a major element as to why it cannot be allowed to benefit. I, the, the principle is you cannot benefit from crime, mm. and I think all countries are in agreement with this. Um, we we try as much as possible not to make it easy. To benefit mm. from crime mm. because I imagine even wash wash just before you speak to this wash wash thing people end up building very nice investment uh, establishments create employment and all that so that you, see, you look at it like it's development but then you wonder what happened to the person who the criminal who brought this here what happens they still face the law or are they given concession and told Jilin in Zuri Sana Kwetu? no I, I think what uh, the, the best practice is always to if you see that the process will take too long, yeah. um, but you have the evidence to sustain the case, you get into a plea agreement with them, perhaps mm -hmm. to cut down some of those uh, bottlenecks that you may face mm -hmm. uh, with recovery of the property and stuff. But there was something you said about, you know, like maybe the property is being sought by another country yeah. and the country is likely to lose that investment. Yeah. Some countries get into agreements. Uh, so, uh, you you agree that we will help you recover this property, then 
we repatriate the money from the sale, but we retain a certain percentage. Uh, yes. Oh, so yes, that that, that happens. Sense. You that get into agreement so that um, because they will, you will need the law enforcement of the particular country yes. that uh, you're yes. working with. Yes. So people should have. That's why we have bilateral and uh, multilateral agreements mm -hmm. and MOUs that we sign with countries to to work out cooperation mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And so, as I said, because of the way you are trying to create a relationship, you create through an MOU some sense of relationship that says, okay, if we if we have this problem, you'll help us in this way. And yes. if you help us, your payback is this. Mm -hmm. we'll, you'll retain a certain amount of the m amount of money recovered or property recovered, mm -hmm. and then you, you bring back the rest mm -hmm. so that now the taxpayers money is able to be utilized for yeah. the purpose that it's it was supposed to be used for. Yeah. Yes. So there's something, there's, there's asset recovery and process of crime. What, how do you, how do you define these two? What, what does ODPP do and what does EFT do when it comes to these two? What's a mandate? Okay. So when, when, when you, when you speak about asset recovery, it's, it's, it's a, com, a, com, a component of many aspects. You know, there is the identification of the assets the tracing of the assets, the seizing of the assets, and then confiscation of the assets. It's, it's, it's uh, those may be main, main, main four aspects. And you could find some aspects. She's the one who's handling, yeah, yeah. or a law enforcement is handling, identification, the seizing. Uh, maybe we go for the applications in court for assist yeah. them. And then once uh, we, we have uh, post-conviction uh, confiscation, mm -hmm. or what people call uh, for feature, mm -hmm. where you get to ask the court, mm -hmm. let this property come back mm -hmm. to where it belonged, yeah. the government, or mm -hmm. we sell it, it comes back. Now we'll find we'll play a more active role. Or civil confiscation of forfeiture, which will be done through maybe a civil kind of process. It's the same way you go, you approach the court, kindly, uh, we pray that you return uh, this property mm -hmm. because it was obviously uh, unlawfully acquired. Proceeds of crime will be basically that that property, uh, money including assets that are acquired through criminal activities. Uh, and it's, it's just a small aspect because there are also the instrumentalities what you use to to commit the, the crime, but proceeds of crime will generally be uh, that those funds or assets that are, are used or are, are acquired as a result of criminal activity. Mm -hmm. Like maybe the house you bought, yeah. the car you bought, uh, using drug money, mm -hmm. uh, and and if you read uh, our Narcotics Act, it's quite a strong legislation that we are hoping to to utilize, mm -hmm. um, so that we we pass a strong message, uh, because it's it's the only it's the only way we'll be able to go ahead when we pass a message that you can't commit crime, and then you we allow you to sit back and uh, live a bougie life. There's there's no such thing. I, I think you remember someone applying that their school. Uh, their children could not attend uh, German yes, lessons yes, yes, or yes. something like that. Yeah. Yes, we want to cut that out. You go back True. to the way you are without the money that you acquired through criminal activity. Yes. We cut that link. We cut the finances that you're using to, f to, to prolong the case in court and to continue um, with your criminal activity. Yes. And uh, going forward, that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not going to relent on this. Yes. Has it been effective taking someone's wealth, cutting off the profit, cutting off the operating capital? Has it been effective in, in fighting corruption? It has been, it's very effective because it, the, the major motivation for committing these offenses is the monetary gain. Yes. So if you take away the gain that you have made all this effort to get, then it, is, it becomes effective because you're ideally targeting what the whole, um, the profit that you're making from this whole exercise. Mm -hmm. But uh, from an investigative point of view, it's a very rigorous uh, exercise that mm -hmm. is also, that consumes a lot of money, that involves tracing assets from one point to another because it involves what is often known as layering. Mm -hmm. So you find somebody mm -hmm. will get money from, let's say, um, the government of Kenya. Then you proceed and send that money to a foreign jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Then you go buy sh stocks, maybe in a foreign country. You go buy an island. Yes, go buy an <laughs> island. <laughs> yeah. Even stocks. Yeah. And then stay with it for two months and sell. And uh, take the money to China and buy Mabatis. And then you come to River Road here and um, and open a shop. And then proceed to sell your Mabatis and put them in a now good bank, a decent bank, bank with KCB. And then uh, after that, put them in a shares account, maybe Steam Asako. 
And then subsequently in the following year, we call you as our super saver and give you an award for, for saving a lot of money with us mm -hmm. and for doing some really good business. Yes. And be a motivational and, and speaker. And you're a motivational <laughs> speaker now. Yes. So we deal with, with personalities who uh, paint a very good picture as hardworking entrepreneurs. Yeah. And, and the task for the investigating organ really is to go down to the roots. Where is this money coming yeah. from? Yeah. So following the money across different jurisdictions, across different financial entities, mm -hmm and tracing it back to say, now this is the proceed. After all this work that you have done, this clean money, this super saver, is really money that was from, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, that was correctly acquired. Yeah. So it is, it's making gains, but it's also a, a tedious process. So and it's quite yes, slow. And it's slow and expensive. Mm. But ah. it's, it's what the investigative organs spend most of their time doing. Mm. I'm sorry, uh, Anita, maybe just to add to what she's saying. Uh, I want to give an example of uh, money laundering, just a small example yes. of how, how this case wash wash could, could use to yeah, clean I money. To give it a human. Now, thing imagine like somebody comes to sell your car. Uh, you, you who's buying it here in wash wash, you say somebody approaches you, I want to buy your car. And they, they have 1.5 million, they have 2 million in cash. You say, I'm selling it for two million. Say, ah, good. That's that's the money I need. Yeah. Uh, that's the kind of car I need. I'll yeah. buy it. Two million, no bargaining. He gives you the two million. He takes the car. He goes mm -hmm. home for a week. Then he comes back. He says, I've changed my mind. This car is very bad. It's not even the car I thought I wanted. Mm -hmm. I don't even like this car. I can't even believe you actually tried to sell me this car. Mm -hmm. And then he causes all kind of uh, fracas, whatever. And then he tries to say return for me my money. He uses bloggers or whatever to yeah. cause uh, tantrums on social media and says you're a thief. Mm -hmm. Then he forces you to return for him his money. Mm -hmm. So you've cleaned the money for him. How? I'm not getting the cleaning part. He's come, he's brought cash. You don't know where that money is from. He's used it to steal. Then he's brought you cash. You've given him a car. You, you've taken that money. You've banked it. Maybe you, you're not on the red. No one is going to suspect ah, you. Mm. Uh, your accounts are clean. You maybe get into that business. No one knows you. Then he comes back. Then because you're afraid of the backlash, you return for him the money. In fact, he even tells you as a compromise, just return for me 1.8 million. I don't need the 2 million. You've cleaned it. And he tells you, don't give me cash. Send it to my bank. Wow. So this is my bank. Wash, wash, money laundering is not necessarily fake money. It's not fake no. money. I am not conditious. Also. When yes. I when I say wash wash myself, I imagine it's about fake money making its way into into the economy. But it's actually just legit money. No, it's, it's not legit, legit money. No, it's the way it, it was acquired. It's, no, the money is yeah. is legal tender. It is legal tender. It's legal tender. But how it was acquired? Acquired. acquired. Mm. It was maybe somebody used uh, stole from a bank or siphoned banks or did wire transfers and got to, was able to transfer or they do robbery with violence, collect money. So that money comes, they collect it in 50 bobs, 100 bobs, even what uh, is done through traffic cops. Yeah. They collect it in bulk. Mm. Then they just go buy an asset. And then that asset, they buy, they either keep it and sell it later mm -hmm. or they do what I've just said, mm. something like that. Yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. I didn't know that myself. I always yes. imagine that Wash wash was about fake money finding its way. So um umziwagari, unapati and have two million fake. And no. then I come demand my money, then you give me good some good two million. No. Clean no, money. No, no, no. Wow. Two it's, million. It's, it's, it's money whose source you, you are reluctant to declare. Because uh -huh. of the systems that have been put in place by the laws and the financial institutions, mm -hmm. the bank would require you when you're making a large deposit to indicate where, what is the source of your funds, mm -hmm. what are you purchasing. And because you're not clear and, and you know the source of your funds is not something that you would like to talk about, so you have to find alternatives for how to clean the money. So wash wash does not mean that the currency you're holding is, is fake. It's fake. It, it, it can be good legal tender. But the sources are illegal, and so you are on a quest to legalize it or to clean it, to make it acceptable. We keep learning every day. That's that's very interesting. Have you? Is there a consideration for privacy when investigating these things? Do you get blockages like eh, private, private, private? What do you do when it comes to criminal aspects? 
luckily the law envisages that um, uh, the the rights to privacy, for instance, would be lifted for purposes of uh -huh. investigating crime. Okay. So if you are looking at uh, we, privacy is respected, which is why you have to go to the courts and obtain a warrant. So you would obtain a warrant so that you can legally investigate. investigate yeah. So when you have a warrant to investigate, that means you have uh, made it clear to the court that these are the issues, these are, this is what you suspect, these are the allegations. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we do not investigate or we do not free, the risk of dissipation or these funds may be lost. Mm -hmm. So some of these rights and privileges are waived specifically to support criminal investigation mm -hmm. because uh, it's a crime. Anyway. It is a crime, yeah. yeah. Have you been successful in recovery in East Africa? Yes, we have been successful in recovering um, so many assets. I think last year, uh, our website actually lists a lot of assets that we have recovered um, to the tune of about 2.1 billion and um, there was land, public land, university land, this public land in Akuru. There are institutions which had been taken by private entities which we have been managed to recover, quite a number of them. So yes, we are proud to say that we have had successful recoveries and we have managed to return a lot of money to the exchequer. We wish you could get some of it back to yeah. our budget, <laughs> but we have managed to get a lot of money back to the government yeah. of Kenya. Yes. So this money goes back to the government? This money goes back to the exchequer. Because my other question is, where does the recovered money go to? <laughs> it, goes, it goes back to the exchequer. To buy yeah. medicine, yeah. To, to pay uh, doctors really, or really judges. <laughs> So, yeah, you talked about plea bargaining and, and other alternatives to justice. How does this work in transnational organized crime? Plea okay. bargaining, for example. Like, uh, you remember the Akasha story? Yes. Uh, no, this one happened on the other side where we were able to help extradite them. And if you notice on the other side, because of the evidence that they had, which was obviously supported with some of the evidence we were able to help them with. They were able to get into a plea bargain because they were cornered. And they saw the only way to, to, to go out. But they got so many years. Yes. So how did but plea bargain work for them? It, it worked for them because perhaps the years they would have, they would have uh, received, if they didn't plea bargain, would have been worse. Mm. Uh, maybe the counts that they would have been charged with were more, mm. and uh, they were able to lessen that burden. On, on themselves. Maybe they, they have a chance of um, getting out early if they do maybe 30 years or so. Uh, I don't have the full particulars, but yeah. it, it, those are usually the dynamics that you consider uh, when you're dealing with transnational crimes. Um, you could also think about maybe perhaps the, the charges that they wanted to, you plead to one and then you forego oh, another, another one, you, you ask to be, to be let go on another, on another front. And also depends on the country. Yeah. You know, some countries have more severe punishments for other offenses than others. Yeah. You would rather plea bargain on it yeah. than than go through the, the penalties the that penalties have been prescribed are, by uh, that law. Yes. Okay, quite interesting. And 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 maybe just to just again, because this discussion keeps coming over and over again, how come their case went so fast? Like it was closed so fast. Because post say that the only way that case was closed is because it was done in the state. Not Kenya, it would have been. But but you remember, I, 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 but I remember I told you uh, I I started by saying you know how money uh, even corrupt money uh, influences even the culture and yes. the systems you have in a country and how the whole the whole purpose of 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 getting into this crime is not only to make profit. But, but also to power and to sustain your business. Yeah. How do you sustain your business? By controlling different aspects of the criminal justice system, the political sphere and everything. So what do they do? They keep these things in the courts mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 they, and, and they ensure that the process is a merry-go-round. You, you take the, an application all the way to the Supreme Court, that one dies, come back, start another one all the way back. They are not in the States. No, they are there. But you see, you remember what I said about keeping up with the systems and yes. uh, legislations and uh, a culture that doesn't entertain it anymore. Mm -hmm. So with time, uh, we continue working as criminal justice actors to insulate the system against these gaps and these abuses that are done by criminal networks. Yeah, I think if I may comment on that one, he makes a valid point on how sometimes other jurisdictions work better than us. Mm -hmm. Because you find that most of our laws, and a good example is the Evidence Act, it sometimes gets very frustrating when it comes to implementing them in, in our countries because foreign jurisdictions, for instance, do not have a problem 
um, some countries, specifically the United Kingdom, with producing photocopies as evidence. But in mm. Kenya, you would really, I mean, you would climb a wall before a court admits uh, photocopy evidence and you really need to put in a background or an explanation as to why it needs to be adduced. Yeah. And sometimes the document is so clear that it, it could not have been manufactured anywhere else. It really is from a public office. Mm -hmm. There's a public officer before the court saying that I'm the one who prepared this document. Mm -hmm. And just because it is a copy, it fails to be produced into evidence. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you do a lot of work really to get the, the, the evidence, but the current uh, laws that are in place mm -hmm. do not allow you to to get away with it so there are amendments that need to be made to our laws to make mm -hmm. prosecuting some of these transnational crimes easier mm -hmm. because when you go to a foreign jurisdiction and ask them for evidence they assume the main assumption is that your country operates the way it operates, it operates. in their country yeah. so when they provide you with a copy of evidence they, they know you're good to go they are sure you're good to go and then they, when they provide a statement a sworn statement in foreign jurisdictions for instance that can be adduced as evidence but when you come to kenya you have to physically come and, and, and give evidence on your own statement. So it's, it now brings in other aspects of calling witnesses from foreign jurisdictions, which is an expensive exercise mm. for, for Kenya and for institutions like ourselves. And um, it just complicates some of these things. Yeah. So why it moves faster in other jurisdictions, they've done away with some of these things. You put uh, in your sworn, yes, yeah. you put in your sworn statements, put in your photocopies, and the parties just come to deal with the specific issues that they have found contentious. Mm. So we don't have to go through all the other baggage yeah. of evidence, just the ones we have identified as contentious, and we deal with those. Let me ask you, because you talked about evidence now, if, see Ivory or what, some bulky evidence was found in a foreign country, and you're prosecuting this guy in Kenya. Do you have to bring all those things back? I mean, Amal, you can just show a picture and say, Nizile. What happened? You, you, you have to be creative. We actually have a case like that um, oh. um, where Ivory was, uh, was smuggled all the way to Thailand uh, and it was disguised as tea. Tea, chai? Yeah, tea. Surely. Wait. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> now the problem is that we needed this Ivory for prosecution yeah. of our cases. Yeah. But now we couldn't, uh, we couldn't get that ivory back here. Yeah. So we were only allowed to go as far as witnessing extraction of that evidence. And of course, now that means, like she said, if we come back here, the courts, will they understand that aspect, that the physical ivory is not with us? Yeah. But we were able to go there and see physically that, yes, this is the ivory that actually originated from Kenya. And we can say from the analysis report that this actually came from Kenya or is yeah. the same ivory that was uh, found in Kenya. They will officials. Yes, they will probably go, yeah. um, or the investigators as yeah. well. But these are the, some of the challenges that you will have to work out. Some of them are not clearly like in the law. You have to now improvise and find ways to be able to, to mm -hmm. make it work, how to introduce secondary evidence where there may be the primary evidence is, 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 is unav unavailable. Yeah. Yeah. And we need, to be, we, we, we need to be able to be progressive and develop mechanisms in which we can be able to not make prosecutions mm -hmm. uh, in a way that is uh, intended to defeat attaining justice. Because justice is not just uh, about um, uh, ensuring that if you're innocent, you, uh, uh, um, you go free, or yes. if you're guilty you convicted in that simple sense. Mm -hmm. It's ensuring that the system is designed in such a way that the truth can be laid there. Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So let's all the facts come through. As it's true, you are seen in a video. Mm -hmm. Let that fact be shown mm -hmm. in the best way it can be. If it's not available in primary, which is the other way we can be able to produce it, maybe secondary evidence. Let's not make unnecessary bottlenecks towards presenting evidence that is or is actually authentic only thing we need to to make sure is that evidence acquired is authentic and it was acquired legally yes, yes. or at least it exists and it and and therefore then we go forward from there so that now we're able to judge the, the you attain justice by ensuring that you're balancing the skills as they should be mm -hmm. you're innocent you didn't do it fine not because you were able to beat the system you're able to beat the law by going round in circles and doing applications up to the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Yes. Okay. Um, is there a picture of success when it comes to combating transnational organization crimes? Is there, is there a place you want, we need to be as a country or as a region? 
is there like a picture of success like is there a country somewhere in the world that has actually successfully managed to to, to sort of tighten the loose on transnational and organized and organized crime okay i i i think i love i love the way the us op, uh, do their stuff you see in in every region they are they make sure that they have their law enforcement uh, agencies uh, present so that they're able to do investigations that have an impact in their country from across the uh, abroad from yes. abroad yes. so they're able to put a connection mm -hmm. that this drugs being trafficked in mombasa mm -hmm. will find themselves it, it, itself in california or in chicago so we need to be able to tie the noose not in not in um, in 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 california or chicago where they are coming from mm -hmm. but where uh, where they are going but where they are actually coming from mm -hmm. So you go to the place, the source, yeah. or the transit point, and 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 start investigating from there mm -hmm. with your team, and 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 arrest the situation early enough. Mm -hmm. yes. Can a country survive? Can can a country manage TOC on its own? No, I think the whole idea that it's transnational. Means you must also be transnational. Yes, in you how must you do your be team. transnational in your approach. As yeah. like we said earlier, it's organized. They are organized in, on their end, and you have to be organized in terms of how to tackle it. Mm -hmm. And really, the best picture or the bigger picture is a situation where all states are on the same page as to how they intend to accord each yes. other assistance. Mm -hmm. That the assistance be expedient, so that when you receive a request, it does not sit on a table for long until mm -hmm. the relevant law, maybe the time, has lapsed for instituting proceedings. Mm -hmm. So that if you have a real-time response to some of the challenges that countries face when they put a request across, mm -hmm. then you can deal with them more adequately. Yeah. So you can't do it alone. It's, it really has to involve a lot of international cooperation. Also, the resources that are involved, because when a request comes to Kenya, for instance, we have to set aside manpower. There has yeah. to be investigators who leave their ordinary tasks to set up to... To investigate, to, to investigate, work on the case, yes, yeah. to gather the evidence that you need to support your prosecution in your country. Mm. So it, it's intentional and it has to be budgeted for mm. and it has to be well coordinated. Mm. So you can't do it alone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what if the penalties of country B are slightly easier than or better than penalties for country A? And the, the, and the offense has been, I mean, umeshi kwa Tanzania, to say me. Tanzanians, the, the penalties in TZ are not as, as harsh as ours. What happens? Do you ask the court to take this person to the harsher side or do you just let the, the dog? No, it depends on who committed the crime. So you see, if it's a Kenyan who committed the crime and is in Tanzania and the crime was, was against a bank here in Kenya and also a bank in Tanzania mm -hmm. and the penalty, we, we have a right to request Tanzania to get that person back because he's a citizen yeah. and also committed a crime here. Okay. But Tanzania also has a right on their side to not only charge them but also to convict them. So uh, we, we could agree on how to go about They could charge, make sure that they are, they are penalized there and even their, their sentence. Then we can ask them, okay, he's been sentenced, now transmit him back. Then mm -hmm. he starts another process here. And then the we case starts afresh here. No, we charge him now for the offense ah, committed okay. in Kenya. And then we again then that then, brings that question of concurrently. So what is what does it mean? No, that's different. That's yeah. for sentence. He's, so if I'm sentenced in TZ Gitonga and then you bring me back to Kenya to, for a different offense. So what happens to that sentence? It's, it still stands. You will you will you can we can agree with Tanzania that you serve your term here and then we'll lodge the, the judgment in our oh. court and then you serve your time here. Yeah. <laughs> a bit complicated. Yes. Yes, yeah, so um, this is Facebook, I think. Uh, thank you. Pinche says it's very educative. Uh, Valiwa Karaoke says it's following. Thank you so much. Liz K. Gitch asks a question. A question. What of this scenario where a 17 year old boy, this must be different, has canon knowledge with a 34 year old mentally challenged woman who is to be charged for which offense and since both are vulnerable? This is different. Yes. Bitonga, this is definitely out of this, but then. Let's help please understand. A 17-year-old boy has carnal knowledge of a 34-year-old mentally challenged woman who is to be charged and for which offense since both are vulnerable. Jaribu. Uh, your your <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, although uh, just, maybe if you say it slowly, I can I can try. But uh, yeah. So a 17-year-old boy. Yes. 
sort of in quotes rapes a 34 year old woman who's mentally who's unstable so the 17 year old is under 18 yes and this woman is mentally challenged yes so who is charged how will the charge read for this offense Okay, I, I don't, I can't say how the charge will yeah, read per yeah. se, uh, but what I can say is that there are different issues that you'll have to consider. Um, there is the aspect, of course, that the lady is uh, mentally uh, challenged, uh, challenged yeah. but there is also the aspect that the boy is under 17. Yes. That means he's not an adult and he's considered uh, a, a child yes. for in, in, in the, with regard to the law. Yeah. So we'll obviously have to look at the facts and see whether to how to treat them yeah. in terms of in the best way possible, to acquire, possible yeah. to ensure that justice is attained for for both the woman yeah. and the young man. Yeah. It's it's a sad situation that one. Hey, there's a long post here. I don't know that I'll be able to read it. Why? Wait, 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 wait. Chet King Jr. says it's long. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You should have said long post a lot. And all Kenyans watching from all spheres, thanks for the informative interaction and enlightenment, basically. Countries have assisted each other in getting evidence for use in criminal investigation and prosecutions. And I understand our country recognizes the importance of international cooperation in combating transnational and organized crime. And is a signatory, this one must be a law student or a lawyer. And is a signatory to several multilateral and bilateral treaties, such as UNAC, the ones you mentioned. So, uh, and my concerns this morning to the experts basing on their insights are, one, what has the ESCC done in regards to the lack of an integrated national policy that is supposed to harmonize various regional agencies. Do you get that question? I don't. Um, um, I don't know what they mean by harmonizing the yeah. regional agencies. Yeah. But in terms of the collaboration between the, the different regions, I think I elaborated on it earlier. Yeah. Other than, the, of course, the multilateral treaties, um, one of them is the, the Commonwealth Agreement that has come to be known as the Harare Scheme. And then I mentioned the East African Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities yes. and the agreements that they have. Mm -hmm. And then I mentioned the Arinza Networks. These are some of the... Um, the networks in force to assist in investigations that are across the East African region. Mm -hmm. So in terms of a, a centered approach to, to fighting corruption, I believe that they are there. There are mechanisms that are in place, mm -hmm. the institutions that are in place. So I, um, maybe, maybe I could try yeah. also. But you know, the whole purpose of these networks mm -hmm. is to be able to ensure that we have either harmonized laws or policies that deal with the same issues. Yeah. So that you find if Kenya, the way we deal with uh, drug trafficking will be similar to the way maybe Tanzania will deal with drug trafficking or if it's a mutual legal assistance, the way we will deal with it is the same way Tanzania will deal with it so that it's certain, it's it's uh, without ambiguity yeah. and, uh, and there's synergy. And the, there's synergy, exactly, and there's uh, no chance for, there's no, the, basically no, uh, it's different so that we avoid those challenges that yeah. are there. So that's the whole purpose of the of the networks. Yeah. And that's why the, the, the people meet in those meetings and then they discuss, okay, we have law B, how do we change law B mm -hmm. so that we and can be able... it's a continuous process. It's a continuous mm -hmm. process, yes. Okay. So he, has, he asks again, what are the basic principles of extradition treaties? And how is the seizure and surrender of property from proceeds of transnational organized crimes done? So he says that is a recent case where a Tanzanian citizen who was involved in money laundering and good business was extradited back to his country. So this person has a question about extradition. How does that work? Okay, um, I'll ask my sister to answer that well, first. Uh, extradition is largely covered in the Mutual Legal Assistance Act, yes, which uh, 2011 which uh, sets, sets aside the procedures for extradition. Mm -hmm. So in layman's language, extradition is just getting a citizen of your country who has committed an offense and is in a foreign jurisdiction. So you bring them back to your country so that they can answer for the crimes that they yeah. have committed. Mm -hmm. So it's stipulated in law and it's done using a mutual legal assistance request, which is a formal uh, request that is done through a central authority. So like in Kenya now, our central authority would be the Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. So you write to the requesting country, let's say Tanzania, and you list out the comment, the uh, offenses that have been committed by this individual, and you request the state to uh, extradite, to allow you to extradite them so that they mm -hmm. can face the charges, the charges that yeah. they have faced. Okay. So that's how it, it operates currently. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mia, uh, you want to say something about this? No. Extradition. I'll, I'll only ask one question. Uh, the gold that was, the picture that we saw was of uh, Ides and Kiyamabati. What, what is, you're doing the, you're doing the gold in the particular? 
No, see, it's, it's a it's a safe box. It's a safe box. <laughs> it's a safe box. <laughs> The, anyway, the, the, the end, the, 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 the means to the end. That was a nice note. I saw for saying that you may catch for Sandukia form one as in yes. their high school. Because even for us breaking it, it was very easy for put to break into your box in high school if you went to, to school. But the like, boxes coming with the different grades also. Sure. Yeah. So the, the Mabati, they have grades. It's just <laughs> not. <laughs> it sounds so funny. Strong enough. Yeah. Safe. Yeah. Mabati. Okay. So uh, number three, how does the ODPP deal with the bilateral treaty? demand by certain states so as to proceed with international cooperation i i also don't understand that question i think maybe you... i can respond yeah. the, that question assumes that you need to have a bilateral agreement with another state for you to get a uh, cooperation yeah. for criminal matters yeah. that's not necessarily mm -hmm. true because there are many states like kenya i think has bilateral agreements with about only three countries okay so we are guided or we are covered by the bigger laws uh, mm -hmm. and the bigger treaties such as the UNCAC now yes. that i mentioned earlier yeah. because it has 140 states who are members okay so sometimes if you find a country that you need support from mm -hmm. in terms of uh, evidence or investigation yeah you can apply reciprocity. That means you can just uh, make a request to the central authority of that country, mm -hmm. whether it be the attorney general mm -hmm. or the body that is tasked and mandated with investigations mm -hmm. and request them to assist you. Mm -hmm. And nothing bars them from doing so just based on reciprocity. That means that in the event you need me to cooperate yeah. with you in future, mm -hmm. we undertake to do the same for you. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't follow that you need to have a bilateral treaty for you to get support. Okay. Maybe yeah. I, I could add on to that. Yeah. There's also maybe the aspect that your signatory is to the same convention, which gives you the yeah. same obligations for cooperation. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if you are all signatories of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, uh, there's a provision on uh, the need for cooperation that you can you you can you can mm -hmm. tap into yeah, that yeah. to be able to 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 ensure that you get cooperation from another country but also remember the networks i told you about mm -hmm. uh let's say like the east africa association of prosecutors mm -hmm. maybe there's a member there we don't have a bilateral i'm just saying yes. as an example yes. maybe there's someone who's we don't have a bilateral or multilateral agreement with them we just use the network, the East Africa Association of Prosecutors, mm -hmm. as a platform for enhancing that cooperation mm -hmm. without any agreement. The agreement will be based on the fact that we are both members mm -hmm. of this association. We are yes. both members of this network. Can we talk? Mm -hmm. Can we agree on a, on a good way we can work this out? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So what has the ODPP done about various victims of offense of transnational and organized crime who are held in foreign countries? That is, we have several Kenyans who are suffering and their rights have been infringed with no one to help them in several parts of the world. A classic example is a case of the Qatari immigrant worker. Though the case was solved, this is just a classical example. Uh, this is still the same person. I think he had enough questions. So it's just about victims. Maybe then this is a point where they need to send their complaints to you. Yes, uh, but also remember there are some countries that like uh, like like you are saying, might not be open to the aspect of exchange of prisoners. Yes. So, th especially when it comes to exchange of prisoners, it, it becomes those bilateral, multilateral yeah. agreements become yeah. quite important. Yeah. Specifically, countries need to be assured mm -hmm. that the person, when they come over, they will serve the term that they were supposed to, to serve. But sometimes you could find that the agreement, uh, that that agreement could be, uh, could be more persuasive when the person has served some time. Mm. Like if they were to serve oh, yeah. 30, they have served 10, you find that there is more room for negotiation at that at that point, yes. Yeah. So uh, the Asset Recovery Agency was established for tracing, freezing, and recovering proceeds of crime and money laundering. The agency is integral in the fight against, this guy must be a student or a lawyer, the way he's <laughs> writing his questions. Um, so uh, Money, the agency is integral in the fight against domestic and transnational crimes. It's a body that I believe is working closely with ESCC in mutual legal assistance together with the AG. But from my perspective, I haven't seen much progress on their side. Could Ms. Chebet give us examples of some fully concluded <laughs> non-cases, if, if, if not all? Actually, I've seen several cases of stashed ill-gotten cash in foreign accounts, majority of which are, are in Swiss. But I haven't heard of a classical case of full prosecution and recovery of such proceeds. So somebody that's... Uh, involved, what's his name? Uh, let me get Chep... Let me get... Let me, I have to scroll. Chep Kien Jr. Chep Ke? Chep Kien. Chep Kien Jr. Mm. Chep Kien Jr. Unachoma. Manze unachoma. Unachoma, manze. Unachoma. 
I also miss Kia. Anyway, so I think Anoliza too, are there real examples that you can actually say this is how we brought back, recovered this, this, and, this and this asset from across the borders? Okay. Yeah. I think I'll give an example of one, although it's ongoing, so I, I think I will, I'll be very brief yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, we have uh, the Anglo listing cases, yeah. and before, because they are before court, I won't delve much into yeah. them. But they are assets uh, belonging to some of these suspect companies that have been frozen in foreign jurisdictions um, over a long period of time. I mean, since the investigations commenced, and ideally, uh, we are awaiting the processes of the courts to come to an end. And uh, when the court gives its verdict, then these assets are ready to be sent back to, mm -hmm. to the various countries. Mm -hmm. So there are assets that have been preserved in several countries, pending determinations of cases that are before court or either pending agreements or negotiations between parties okay. as to how those cases can be finally determined. Okay. Yeah. I hope we may scare Chip Kiang. Uh, does the ODPP and ESCC have a working registry and archive system for capturing the data for efficiency and proper policy implementation? Yo! <laughs> it's the same one. Yes, yeah, questions. <laughs> questions. Yeah. So, um, well, could you exchange, exchange, exchange program? Could you exchange program to Kuanesha? My, my, my. Yani, I can't even finish anyway. Once more, and one, my appeal is Kenyan to Kenyans. It's let's try to enlighten one another because with industrialization and dynamics of technology, it's easy to fall prey a bet or be part of transnational organized crime, see you equally, willingly or unknowingly. To the ODPP and ESCC, you should do more public participation and create awareness on these crimes and understand how the criminal justice system operates. I understand regional integration is a multi-sexual facet and I wish your institutions and all the stakeholders all the best as you tackle this critical dynamic field. In my opinion, though you need more funding and increased personnel for efficient and effective discharge of service. Yani, I didn't read all these questions. We had like 10 questions. But he's invited to come and have a have tea yeah. with Gitonga here yeah. for more information. Yes, so, yes. Can yes. Can it be something? Yes, please, please come over. <laughs> Kuja right. chai. Okay, we'll touch up quite. She's very informative. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Um, Stephanie Weymore says, good morning. The show is informative. Keep it up. Avanti says, very informative discussion. Uh, what else? Let me see if I have left at someone. Chip Kiang, I didn't read all your questions. But please, uh, just you'll you find time and come and have tea with us and you'll get uh, more insights on today's. Uh, Juliet Kamau says, this is very informative following. Well done, Senior Gitonga and Chibet. And then let me see. Uh, Martin Mugo, when does it mean when sentences have to run concurrently? I think it comes from the court case that we mentioned earlier that someone may run their 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 sentences concurrently. What does it mean? At the same time. So if you've been if if, if you've been uh, sentenced to five years on one account yeah. and another five in another one, yeah. you'll serve five. Okay. At this, it's you combined into one time. at the same time. All right. So Mary on YouTube says tuned in, great discussion. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, we had enough questions today from one person, because there's another star student who has not tuned in today. But I like that there's been engagement and I hope you've liked it as well. I want to come to the end of this show today. Uh, let me tell you, this guy said, thanks for the invite, how can I reach out? Tell him to 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 write an email and an email to info at odpp.go.ke. All right, check in send an email. Definitely, Gitonga will at Aishika. I love to invite to Kuje U Kunye Chai Chai Okweli. See you there, Wongo. Chai Chai Chai. Ah, so I think we should come to the end of this discussion. Of course, uh, not conclusive. Yes, not, not conclusive. I mean, looks like we can't finish this discussion. There's so much to it. And what you're saying is that uh, no country can win this uh, TOC on its own. We need collaboration. We need participation with, I mean, those, all those agreements that you're talking about, multilateral and bilateral, right? Yes. Yes. Bitonga, I want to give you like two, three minutes to talk about the upcoming conference. Okay. So uh, the East Africa Association of uh, Prosecutors will be mm -hmm. having a conference uh, from the 30th uh, to 31st, um, where we'll be having 
around 20, 12, 12 prosecution authorities that will be meeting from the uh, uh, Eastern African region, uh, where we are hoping to discuss issues of how to combat uh, wildlife crime as an economic and organized crime aspect. We are hoping to discuss uh, at least four facets of, of this. Uh, corruption as an economic crime and how it affects um, the region and the area. Um, asset recovery on how we can be able to utilize assets to recovery as a tool. Uh, also, we're going to be looking at uh, how to foster more regional and international cooperation among ourselves. And lastly, how to be able to ensure we are able to combat wildlife crime using high impact uh, prosecutions. Mm -hmm. Remember, high impact prosecution is a strategy that uh, allows us not only to focus on uh, mtumdogo, you focus on the cases that will be able to create an impact in the society and also be able to send a strong message to those who are involved. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, the East Africa Association of Prosecutors is being hosted by our brothers, uh, the National Prosecution Services mm -hmm. in uh, Tanzania, who are key members of the East Africa Association of Prosecutors. Mm -hmm. uh, we, the ODPP Kenya is supporting them because we are currently, we are also uh, hosting the EAP Secretariat, of which I coordinate. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's how we are able to coordinate with our yeah. brothers in Arusha. Yeah. Uh, we'll have also other uh, prosecution authorities that will be there, that some we have already invited and we want to be members. And we're hoping we can be able to use the opportunity to discuss those issues I have, yeah. uh, uh, have raised. Uh, the conference will be hybrid. It will be physical and it will be yeah. also um, televised uh, yeah. in some sense of uh, link. Mm -hmm. So we will be able to find ways to share the link with most of you so that you can be able to tune in and be able to uh, see someone so the and follow. Is allowed to participate in yeah, if uh, they, they, they're able to uh, get the link and be able to uh, get uh, access to the uh, the link, mm -hmm. they're able to follow the proceedings and they'll be able to follow the discussions ah, okay. uh, that are going place. Okay. It'll be in Arusha, Tanzania. All right. right. So I never knew until now that wildlife was a big deal in East Africa. All these crimes, all these crimes are, are, are tied together. The, yeah. As I said, wildlife crime, when you, you do the poaching, the money is used to fund yeah. uh, drugs or drug trafficking or used even to fund other businesses uh, or con, uh, uh, conflage other businesses. And this is, wildlife is actually one of the centers of uh, one of the things that uh, transnational organized crime uh, is all about. Mm. Uh, wildlife crime is, is actually quite huge. And the kind of income that criminals get from wildlife is immense and uh, and you know also the effect on the e economy and the environment yeah. uh, what it does to our elephants and the and the number of an, uh, endangered species that we have mm. yes okay thank you so yes. much for that thank you so much for the question me. are we winning are we ever going to win this corruption this curse of our generation we we have to be positive and then what i would like to say is that we have made strides and they are um, efforts have been put in place to ensure that transnational crime is being combated. I mean, the East African community is at the forefront. Most member countries, it starts with the willingness of the member yes. states to assist one and another. And there's political will. There's political will. We have statutes, the law. Mm -hmm. We have law that can enable us to move forward. Mm -hmm. We just need maybe to increase the bilateral treaty so that it's more clear yeah. how we can assist one another. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of progress, it's not a hopeless, it's not a situation of despair. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are great strides that have been made and there are channels now that are open mm -hmm. that one can explore in terms of getting maybe evidential material or prosecuting cases yeah yeah okay it's not a hopeless it's situation. not hopeless yes yeah it's not hopeless all right so um i'd like to come to the end of this show today i thank you so much for engaging with us on, on our platforms we definitely continue engaging with you as you've heard again like we keep saying the law is clear there are institutions there are now agreements between countries and amongst countries but then the question still begs what are you going to do about it usipatikane on the wrong side of the law so that you are either being used in this transnational and organized crime or you are perpetrating it you know you can be found on either side so be woke be aware that you can be used uh, you can be used or abused in this space so that is all for today i hope you've gotten something from it at least i have 
keep engaging, keep asking, and you get the answers you want. As you're saying, the show is about is about empowering you so that you know what to do when you're caught in this in a situation or or someone close to you is caught in a situation. Uh, I'd want to wish you a very good weekend ahead and a nice week. Uh, the next week, of course, like Ichonga has mentioned, uh, the audit will be in Arusha with the East Africa Prosecutor Association. Association of Prosecutors. I keep just confusing the, the acronym. But EAAP. So prosecutors will be in uh, Arusha to discuss, amongst other things, again, corruption, uh, wildlife, and other things that are, that come in within the transnational and organized crime. So you are allowed to follow the proceedings. A link will be shared for you if you want to 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 watch the, the proceedings because uh, Gitonga said it's going to be hybrid. So that people will be there and the guys are going to watch it online. Again, we live in the times that call for this sort of arrangement. Thank you once again. I've enjoyed the show and I hope you have. Have a blessed week ahead and look out for our discussion again next week. Thank you so much.